how do we find those focal points, which machines in our industry as a whole, not just my brand, don't run up to their capacity because there's a lot of operator intervention. And that's what we've really been focusing on. Hello my friends and welcome back to MTD CNC. I'm with my buddy James today and we're gonna talk automation in the world of woodworking. Now, if you watch our channel regularly, which I'm sure you all do, we do a lot of metal. Now, woodworking has its own difficulties, whether it's differences in the material itself or the fact that there's so many jobs that are just one-offs instead of having large batch sizes. But with James being here, and as I always tell you, I bring the experts with me as I am not one, but I like <laughs> to bring them to you so James, we're in the world of woodworking. You work with Styles, one of the largest companies in this industry. Let's talk about automation and where you see. Firstly, let's give people the courage in woodworking to understand how automation works, yeah. and then part of the growth of how we've adapted to the woodworking world in automation. Yeah, so we've been working here to kind of change the perception of what, what automation is to the industry, right? So when I came into woodworking 15, 16, 17 years ago, Automation was viewed as a way to almost entirely decrease the amount of employees in our shop, right? Mm -hmm. So it has it kind of carried a negative stigma, right? Like, oh, great, he's going to bring in a, a router or he's going to bring in a robot like we have here behind us, and I'm not going to have a job anymore, right? Over the course of the last 15 years, that that goal or that justification has changed to not removing headcounts, right? Our human capital in our companies is the most important piece of our, of our businesses, right? So what we're doing now is, is creating robotic systems or automated systems that come in and allow us to better utilize the human capital that we already have, right? Not necessarily get rid of them, but take some of the mundane, boring, right? Just head scratching, nodding off, work away from the operator and allow us to redeploy that human resource in an area of the shop that is, is a more value added approach, right? So we utilize the systems now to, to take away things from the operator that also slow down the machine. Does that kind of make sense? It absolutely right, There makes are sense. certain things like this machine here behind us, it's a bore and dowel machine. A good operator will run that machine up to about 60% of its capacity or 60% efficiency because there are a certain amount of steps that the operator has to take before the machine gets back in the cut, as we like to say. So load a board, load a program, push a button, push a foot pedal, turn the part, flip the part. All of that happens while the machine is not in the cut, right? So in essence, the machine is not operational, but not broken. It's waiting for a person to do some non-value added task. So that's been our focus in automating the woodworking industry. How do we find those focal points? Which machines in our industry as a whole, not just my brand, don't run up to their capacity because there's a lot of operator intervention. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've really been focusing on. I think those are all really valuable points. For those of you out there watching right now, when we think of automation, if you're still living in the mindset of that robot is taking my job, please understand that we have a massive skills gap right now in the industry. So we're actually trying to adapt to that skills gap and not taking anyone's job. We're just, as James said, removing the mundane, removing the dirty, removing the dangerous even. Absolutely. We're not breathing in the same fumes. This is what automation is supposed to do. Now, to get more specific into the woodworking side of things, Automation has maybe taken a little longer to adapt into companies because there's so many different variables with wood itself. Would you like to go over some of those variables and then also how you're adapting to it? Yeah, absolutely. So in the woodworking industry, we say we're a small batch operation. Automation in the automotive world, we may program a robot and it may do a million cycles of the same thing, right? That's different than when we say batch one or small batch where one kitchen is made, followed by another kitchen. They're absolutely different. So you have to reprogram the robot for every change in, or every variation that comes through. We've been able to work with integrators like this one behind us, Automatech Robotic, where they're creating systems where the woodworking company doesn't have to have a, an automation engineer on staff who's, who's ridiculously good in writing G-code, right? So we're taking data from the machine processing the parts, bringing it into the robot. The robot is reading that data that already exists, right, coming from the, the CNC or a panel saw, and it's creating its own G-code. So it tells the robot where to put the part. 
It, it tells the Born Dahl machine when to start the cycle. So we kind of got to think of it like how the CNC world has grown in the woodworking industry, right? We do proprietary front ends. We have a small programming system on the front of the machine so that the operators or the businesses can, can program the machine. We do it visually, right? You draw a square, you put your line bores in, you make your toe kick, then the machine reads that visual, writes its own G code, and we run the program. So we've taken that approach that is well known over at least 20 years in the woodworking industry, and we found a partner in Automatech that has mastered that. Give me what you already do. I'll automate the handling, right? But I'll also automate the data. So now that we've gone over that we need to automate because of skills gap, because we're removing the mundane, the dirty, the dangerous, all this type of stuff, now we've created a simpler platform so people can become accustomed to it. Let's go over a little bit of the cost. Now, if I'm looking at specifically the cell behind us, if I was gonna take a guess, it's probably three co-workers that I would have right now that would typically be doing a manual job of some sort. Yep. And if I'm gonna hire three people to do that job for the next five, 10, 15 years, which I'm hopeful to train and grow these people, right? Yep, absolutely. Or I bring in a robot because there is a skills gap and maybe I can't find those three people to help me. Yep. The cost effectiveness of this robot is actually less expensive than the cost of investing in those people, I would say. Am I correct in thinking this? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a running joke in the industry because we always ask how much it costs. That's the first question that a lot of us ask, right? Before we do the due diligence of what does it remove from my payroll, right? Oh, it's, it's not a, these, are not, these are not transactions. These are investments, right? And we got to look at them over the cost of 15 years. And when you say, this is what it costs to buy it, and this is the payback over 15 years, the answer is almost... It doesn't matter because you can't afford not to make this level of investment. So taking what James said and taking how I brought that into play, I also want to reiterate that we're not taking jobs because there is a skills gap. When I think about three people, it's hard to find three people. And even if I did, oftentimes there's one guy in my shop right now that wants to make more money by learning an automation cell and letting the robots do all the work anyway. So we don't have to fight anymore and train anymore. We do want more people in this industry. We're not taking from that, believe me. There are a million people skills gap right now. Automation just helps us grow and run through the night. Now, I know we just glided over softly, James, but I'd like to go back into you mentioned these are single batches, maybe a double batch. Yep. And I've made the mistake working in the woodworking industry where I had a lazy Monday or a lazy Friday and I didn't blow up the sawdust and so my next piece of plywood that went on my router machine, the parts were all over the place and yep. I scrapped an entire board. I know that's just one of the things that automation is trying to adapt to in woodworking. Yep. Absolutely, so woodworking is difficult for automation because we have a lot of variation in part sizes from two inches by four inches up to four inch, four feet by eight feet and even bigger, right? So there's a lot of variation there. Surface texture, when we're dealing with end of arm tooling on robots, we have to be able to handle different surface textures and warp, twist, bow, and the dreaded sawdust, right? That, that comes from what we do. So the systems now are being built understanding the variation and the frustration and the inconsistency that's in our industry, right? So I think it's important to understand here that there are a lot of integrators in, in the world that can do pick up a part and move it, pick up a part and move it, spin it, cycle, tell another machine to start. But it's almost in the woodworking industry as a metalworking integrator will take a woodworking project as a hobby, right? They get into it, they deliver it, they make it work, but it's not completely functional because they just don't understand how to deal with the dust, right? There are a few integrators in the world, like Automatech, that are taking woodworking robotics as their only business model. It's not what they do as a hobby, it's what they do as their whole, their whole current business and the whole, that's how they're gonna grow. And when you make that choice, you force yourself to understand the in intricacies and inconsistencies of the woodworking market. Yeah, I love it. For everyone watching right now, think about this. If you're hesitant in the woodworking world to get into automation, firstly, just let me say, we kind of have to. We just, whether we're fearful of it, whether we think we can't afford it, whatever those, those roadblocks or speed bumps are that are stopping you right now, 
Automation is now. It's not even the future anymore. It's how we profit, and it pays itself back so quickly. Working with companies like Styles, working with people like James, allows you to have the confidence that you need moving forward because you have the support that you need for any questions you might have. We're not taking jobs. We're adding jobs. We're adding proficiency. We're adding precision and accuracy. All of this stuff comes into play. So if you come into this conversation a little bit hesitant about automation, I would ask you to give James a call, give Styles a call. It's worth having that conversation because ultimately it's going to make you money. And once we remove that fear, that's where all the good stuff happens. So James, thank you so much for conveying this message, removing the doubt of all the inconsistencies that happen in the woodworking world and allowing the audience to understand this as well. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.